Hello, Richardson ISD. I'm Dr. Jeannie Stone, your superintendent, and the purpose of this video is just to be a complement to our blueprint that, as promised, we are releasing to our RISD community on August 3rd. I am joined today by two very important people, and then throughout the course of this panel, we're just going to be bringing in some more people just to have a conversation and answer some questions that we know are important, and we know that they're important because they've been asked by our parents and our staff members, either through Let's Talk or through email. So I am joined today by my friends. My name is Karen Clardy, and I'm president of the Richardson ISD School Board. And I'm Lalita Howell, uh, the current president for RSD Council of PTAs. So we're just going to have a conversation. And as y'all know, our number one priority in Richardson ISD uh, is safety safety going into this school year. And so our blueprint is going to be really an outline of all of the protocols that are going to show all of our parents, all of our staff members, all of our students, everything, what to expect about the 21-22 school year in Richardson ISD. So um, I know that you all, you all have brought some questions and um, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Great, Dr. Stone, could you share some of those health protocols, those key ones that you're going to be implementing uh, via the blueprint for this year? Right, well, first and foremost, as y'all know, we are going to be in compliance with Governor Greg Abbott's executive order prohibiting um, government entities, including school districts, from mandating masks. And um, so masks will be optional. And so that's important that everyone understands that because the school district is a governmental entity, then we have to be under that executive order. Um, we're going to, based on public health authorities, which we are going to continue to stay in close contact with them, RISD will strongly encourage all students and staff to wear a mask during school uh, while indoors. Um, and there are going to be a lot of other routines and screeners and things like that that in, at, toward the end of this video, I'm gonna bring in our health services to answer for y'all. But do you mind illustrating a little bit what that protocol might be? How is it encouraged for families? After uh, I released a video last week, I had a, a message from a parent that asked w if we were going to use some type of coercive language to coerce students to get vaccinations or to coerce students to uh, wear masks. And, you know, my reply back was, well, of course not. You know, that is, that is in, in no way the spirit of Richardson ISD. The encouragement that we're making is simply to parents because it's a parent's choice, right? right, right. And we, we respect that. And so um, in any encouragement, we'll go through parents, uh, but nothing that would be coercive or make students or families uncomfortable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stone. That's good to hear. Um, can you talk about specific actions that the district is going to take to ensure that the facilities are safe for this year to continue to keep the virus out? Yeah, uh, we learned so much last year, as we all know. Um, we learned so much just as the, cor as the course of the year went on. But one of the things that we are going to be doing is we're going to be providing a new air purifier filtration system in every single good. one of our classrooms. Good, good, good. And that is one of the things that we've heard throughout the summer of uh, parents really asking and being concerned about. And this is definitely a new enhancement to our uh, classrooms. We will have clear desk shields that will be available to any student uh, or teacher in school at their request. We, we know that that makes, is going to make a lot of parents uh, comfortable to have that as an option, and we will have plenty of those to go around. Um, and then, of course, the things that we know are, are so important about just the um, hand washing in, in, our, in our, especially our elementary grades. Uh, beginning of the year reminders of students about safety protocols. There's going to be a lot of that just to make sure that we're keeping everyone educated about staying safe. And then we're going to be, especially with our younger kids, demonstrating the proper uh, hand washing procedures and techniques um, and, of course, encouraging the frequent use of hand sanitizers. But we learned so much last year as we went through the pandemic about ways that we can keep our facility safe and all of those things will stay in place going into this school year as well. That's, Wonderful. That's great news. That's great news. Um, I think the next question I have is, um, how is the district handling the, the contact tracing and quarantining this year? 
Um, can you give us a little bit of information on that? So this is a great time for us to bring in a few of our experts. <laughs> and I've kept, of course, if you know about Richardson ISD, collaboration is one of the most important things for us. Mm -hmm. The board collaborates with community and with staff. PTA, one of our partners, greatest partners to collaborate with. We, we, we make very, very few decisions in isolation. And so I'm going to bring in our Deputy Superintendent, Tabitha Branham, and our Director of Health, Health Services, Ashley Jones, and they're going to help us to answer some of these questions. Why don't we start with you, Ashley, and then Tabitha, you may join in with some of the other answers to that. Absolutely. So, you know, um, when students or staff are sick, whether at home or at school, we're going to just follow the CDC guidelines and if they're showing fever of 100 or greater or any loss of taste or smell, any kind of congestion, we're going to be following those detailed things and working with our parents to make sure that this is a new thing, this isn't a pre-existing condition that they maybe struggle with and really referring to the medical providers. You know, not only do we worry about COVID, but we also have to think about things like strep and flu. So we're really gonna be working with parents this year and our local providers to make sure that we really give our students the best care that we can. Just to follow up um, on what Ashley was sharing related to cohorting and implementing social distancing, it's important for us all to remember that one of the key differences from last year to this year is that our students are back 100% in person. Um, as we all know, TEA and our, our legislators did not provide us with an option to provide a virtual school and receive any funding. So that means that an elementary student, uh, an elementary classroom may have 25 students and our high school classes may have up to 30 students. So we are strongly recommending in the blueprint that our principals implement social distancing when possible, um, especially when we are inside. Um, and we're also going to be really working at the elementary level like we did last year that we allow cohorts. Um, and one of the ways that we're going to track that is by ensuring that we have tight seating charts so that at any time if a student is symptomatic or um, we receive word that a student is, is COVID positive, that our nurses and our principals can immediately access those seating charts and we're going to know who that student was around and who might um, have been exposed to any potential risk. What if a student or a staff member tests positive for COVID? That's a great question. So once someone tests positive for COVID, um, if it is a student, the parent will reach out to the campus and we often will direct them to the nurse and they'll begin that discussion about what day they tested positive, when they started experiencing symptoms, and just kind of confirm their attendance timeline within that. Once we have for sure verified that they are positive for COVID, we will then start to contact trace. So we'll be going to that child's classroom and meeting with the teacher, looking at the seating charts and really making sure that we identify anybody that was within six feet for at least 15 minutes of that positive individual for at least 24 hours. And we do a really good job working with our principals and our teachers just to make sure that we are properly identifying and keeping the right kids um, as safe as we can be. Hmm, very interesting. So what about someone who has been identified as a close contact to a positive person? So we will be following CDC guidelines, um, which says that you have to quarantine to monitor for symptoms. So just like we did in the spring, um, there will be several different options for students um, when they are identified as a close contact, where they will be monitoring for symptoms, and then there's different options where they can test out of quarantine based on how they're feeling. So our goal is to do what's best for the family, but also keeping our students safe. So the nurses will work really hand in hand with the families to make sure that they know all the different options that are available to returning to campus. Ashley, I know um, with vaccinations being available to some of our students um, and, and to, to our staff, how do vaccinations also play a part in terms of if a student or staff member has to quarantine as a result of a close contact tracing? Yes. So as we make our list of those who were exposed, we will be asking parents and staff members if they've been COVID vaccinated. And it's just voluntary information, but if they are able to provide us a copy of their vaccine card, we are able to um, say that they are not exposed because the CDC currently says if you are fully vaccinated and it's been greater than two weeks since your last dose, you are not considered exposed to a positive case. You know, this is a great opportunity for us to praise our nurses. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And the job that our nurses did last year was just 
remarkable. We're so grateful. I know that you know our goal is to have our students in class learning. We want them in class learning, but we also have a priority and responsibility to keep our students safe. Um, one of the things, Tabitha, I know as we've been hearing from Let's Talk and we've been getting emails is that whenever we have, to, it, it can be really frustrating whenever we have to quarantine our students and they're quarantined for, for potentially you know, up to 10 days. What is the district doing maybe differently this year to ensure that while, while a student is in quarantine that learning continues? Absolutely, it can be frustrating and I was a mom and I had two students in the district. I had a kindergartner last year and a freshman in high school. Um, that is something that as a parent I worried about and what would happen if my child had to quarantine and was at home when I knew I had to come to work. Um, and so we, uh, thanks to your leadership and to our entire Blueprint design team, we really have thought a lot um, and, and really thought hard about how do we better support our parents this year if, they do, if their child does experience a quarantine. So a couple of things that we're going to do. The the first thing I want to remind parents, if internet access continues to be a challenge or a barrier, please contact your campus or our district's technology um, team. We have hotspots that have um, data, live data that any parent can check out and access at any time. And for our families maybe who have multiple students at home as well, um, we can uh, check out more than just one hotspot because we don't want, ever want internet access to be a barrier to, to kids learning on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, if for some reason a student is either positive, COVID positive, or they are asked to quarantine because of a close contact, if I'm an elementary student, um, one of the things that we're going to be doing differently this year is that last year our parents and our teachers experienced co-seating. So if I was um, teaching in person or if I was learning in person and then I was quarantined, the next day I would be at home and I would be expected to Zoom in with my teacher who was still teaching most of the class in person, but I may have been the only student at home learning. Raise your hand if you want to go back to co-seating. No, I and I speak for all of the teachers that we will not be co-seating this year in Richardson ISD. But we, we, we don't want our kids to just be home for multiple days and then have to play this, this really rigorous catch up whenever they get back. So what are we doing? So we are hiring a expert, highly qualified kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade teacher. Um, that their role and responsibility is going to be following the district curriculum. So we all across the district, whether I'm at Merriman Park, I'm at Mohawk, or I'm at Spring Ridge, or I'm at Audelia Creek Elementary, we follow a scope and sequence where each day we know what our teacher is going to be teaching. What is that content, that skill that that teacher is going to cover on that day? This uh, district teacher is going to be helping create the videos um, and any online material that that student is going to need so they can still learn that content just like they are learning it um, back in their homeroom classroom at their home campus. Um, parents will be given information on how they are going to connect with this new teacher and how um, they're going to be able to in the morning be introduced to that person where this first grade teacher is going to be able to walk them through the day and how to access these online materials, these resources, how to turn in the homework, how their student is going to receive feedback. So I know immediately, is my student learning what they need and I don't have to worry that they're falling behind. That information is going to be shared by that teacher to the, your child's homeroom teacher. So again, you're not going to miss a grade in the grade book. All of that information is going to flow directly from that teacher to that homeroom teacher. And that's an absolutely new practice that we're putting in place. I know one of the questions that's going to come is going to be, well, what about the kids who are in junior high and high school? What about that same option for them? So I know we've thought that through a lot, so kind of explain that. Absolutely. So for our secondary students who are quarantined, um, we know that they um, are able to access our our teacher's Google Classroom, and we have other digital materials and supports that are available where our te teachers are going to be asked to, they post those assignments, they will post those materials, they will set up virtual office hours. So if a student or a parent has questions around any of that material that they are learning, they're going to be able to ask those questions during those virtual office hours or through Google Classroom. Um, so all of that will be um, posted and, and supported directly so that the student knows exactly how how to access it and if there are any questions they
they can do it just in time. Um, we, we needed to think about that a little bit differently at secondary because there are so many course offerings. Um, we offer chemistry five different ways in the district. Um, and so we really are working hard with our high school and junior high principals um, to make sure that this process is easy both for teachers, but also for our parents and our students. And it was in particular, we had a lot of questions from parents because they know that the kids that are under t the age of 12, they can't get vaccinated. Yes. And so, you know, we really wanted to make sure that, especially going into this year, we don't know what our numbers are going to look like, but we wanted to have those options uh, there in place. And that's, that's definitely something that is new. Um, Can I ask a question? Sure. How are you handling the absences? Um, is there going to be a change from last year? as far as the quarantine absences and the COVID absences? Um, yes, thanks. You know, TEA does listen. While we may not agree always with some of the decisions that they make, um, we really had a, a voice um, with TEA that we know we had parents that were very concerned that they may have received truancy letters um, or um, felt like their student had these unexcused absences that were built up even mm -hmm. though they had mm -hmm. to quarantine because they were determined to be in close contact. Well, TEA has added a new absence code that we are now going to be able to use whether you are COVID positive or you are quarantining because of a close right. contact and they will not count um, towards any student absence. So it will not count towards truancy um, as an unexcused or an excused absence. That's great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, okay. So what, w w can you let the community know if a district can require COVID-19 vaccinations? Like what, what, I think it's important that everyone knows and hears from us what can and can't be required. Absolutely, so we cannot require anyone to show us proof of any COVID vaccine. We can't ask, we can ask all day that they get vaccinated, but there can't be any kind of repercussion or any kind of um, expectation that they have to follow through what we've requested. So as far as like teachers, they can choose to show us to exclude themselves from a quarantine or parents can cho choose to give us the um, vaccine information prior to any cases happening so we don't have to identif their, identify their child. But we cannot require anyone to show us. Yeah, so I just want to, you know, make sure that we're sharing with parents, with the board, with the community, with staff, that again, this is a choice. This is a choice for a health matter. And we as a district are going to, uh, at all times, be respectful of the choices that our, our families make. Um, any questions from y'all before we bring in our next panelist? Absolutely. Um, how... Uh, knowing how important is the support of the family for success and students, what does the district plan and how will it be handled the volunteer forces that are eager, are waiting to support all the efforts that you have done in the past 18 months? You know, I think we missed a lot last year in terms of sometimes smiles and hugs, but we also missed our PTA and we missed Thank our you. parent Likewise. volunteers. And so we are working on opportunities to have them back. Tabitha, can you highlight some of that? Absolutely. And as you mentioned, um, it's not just our volunteers that are supporting activities that happen on the campus or parent engagement. It's also academic opportunities like tutoring. And um, we know with the way that we need to accelerate learning, how do we bring those volunteers but do it in a way that still honors um, the safety of, of our campuses so we are currently still not allowing any third-party leasing of our buildings for right now um, we are going to be limiting volunteers in this way it, when a, a parent uh, or volunteer enters our campus we're gonna be working with principals that they assign them to a central location like a library or if they have a materials or resource um, room um, where we can ensure that there can be social distancing implemented and that our risk mitigation protocols are followed. Um, we will not have volunteers at this time while the current COVID rate is spreading at such the rate. We're not going to have them directly pushing into classrooms where students are right now. Um, we are again going to encourage them to follow um, all of the risk mitigation protocols that are in the, in, in the blueprint while they are on campus as well. 
Right now, again, our cafeterias will be closed during lunch. So I know I have a first grader and I cannot wait, my husband cannot wait for the first time that we can bring him lunch and we can sit and eat lunch with him. Um, and that will be something that we will do and we will allow as a district once we know um, that our, we can do that safely and that we're not putting any of our students or staff at risk. For at this time, cafeterias will, will be closed for lunch. Tabitha, I know, I, I mean, you and I have been just looking at all of the questions and we're so grateful for all of the input that we've gotten from our parents in our community. When you have a question, we have a Let's Talk feature on our website where if you ask the question, you're gonna get an answer back. Um, and Tabitha does answer a lot of those questions and so give her so many much kudo questions, for, uh, uh, just credit for that. But one of them that I do know that has come in is about our special populations for our students. And that is a concern for our most vulnerable students. So yes. will you just speak to that? Absolutely. Um, I think for any of our students that are currently served through our special education services program or maybe you're on a 504, um, that ultimately if, if you believe that your child has an existing medical condition that may prevent them from attending in person because we know there may be some families that, that do meet these qualifications. We are going to ask that you reach out to our special student services coordinator Jessica Garrett and we will be providing that um, contact information to um, really analyze and determine our homebound um, criteria. It may be that your family, that your child specifically meets that criteria under 504, Section 504 mm -hmm. or under an individual education plan where we could serve them through homebound services. But that is a one-by-one -one individual conversation. You know, everything that we're doing, we're going to be monitoring, okay? And so, um, we're putting on our blueprint this next week. We're going that this week after we put it out on the third. We're going to ask for parent feedback, and there will be a, a place on our website that that can be provided. We're calling it a draft until um, we start school and re release that. But we really, we really think that we'll be able to finalize this within a week. But um, just want everyone to know that as we move forward, there there could be some other unknowns. Um, and we, 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 but we're, we love the spirit that we are building in our community to work together because we do all have the same vision that is to make sure that all students are safe and all students uh, connect, learn, grow, and succeed. And just so appreciative of the part that everyone plays with that. All right, so we sort of switched up some of our panelists um, here joining us at our round table because we really wanna hear from some people where the magic really happens and, and that's at the campus level. So we've brought in three of our amazing principals, one elementary, one junior high, and one high school principal. And we're just gonna really have a conversation with them about how it's really going to happen at the campus level. So um, first I'd like you to start, let's start with Josh. Just introduce yourself, um, let's go around and you each introduce yourself. And this is the question that I just want y'all to just kind of talk to us about and that's, that's gonna be as we go into the 2021-2022 school year, how are you going to support our students as we launch this new year? So let's start with you, Josh, intro, and then let's go around and then let's just kind of cover that question. I'm Josh Eason, I'm the principal at Richardson North Junior High. Uh, starting my 25th year as an educator in RISD, I'm really proud to be a part of this district. The ways that we support students um, being in a junior high, we're, we're really accustomed to transitions, right? So we, we bring in new kiddos to our seventh graders that have been in elementary school, and we send our kiddos off to be high school students, and we have this two-year window. Um, so our staff is really adept to um, supporting kids that are in transition, and many of our kids that are going to be joining us this year may be in transition uh, when it comes to maybe they haven't been in school for quite some time, and they're coming back to the campus. Uh, I think that one of the things that we do really well is that uh, we, um, we accept kids where they're at and we help them grow really quickly. Um, our teachers um, are great with junior high kids. They, they know that they're exploring new things about themselves. They're uh, learning new things about being a great student. And so when we think about um, coming out of a pandemic, we really focus on um, helping them build up those great skills that they've learned to be a really great student. And so our scholars uh, will learn about how to be organized and how to read and write at a high level and all those things. Um, uh, but more importantly, it's their social life too, right? We want them to really continue on uh, building great relationships with educators and with their friends at school. Um, and we want to do that in a way that's safe for everybody. It's safe for our staff and safe for our students. 
and we're really excited about this opportunity with our kids. I'm Helena Lopez. I'm the principal at Merriman Park Elementary. And we are so excited to see our kids back this year. We know that our students have been experiencing a heightened level of anxiety and stress. And so one of the things that we have really been working um, on as leaders and principals is how can we support all of our students when they're coming back this year with that stress and that anxiety level. So at the elementary level, one of the biggest things we're doing is we're starting before the kids even come back to school. So our teachers are coming back on August 9th and we're so excited. And so we are building in time for professional development during that time period for us to really talk to teachers about how important it's going to be to build connections with students and to help create a culture in their classrooms of belonging, of unity, um, at an elementary, the biggest part is going to be in the morning during our social emotional learning time. That's part that's built into our instructional calendar, the first 20 minutes of the day. And so it might look like a morning meeting or a circle up and the kids are really coming together and getting to know their teachers and their classmates on a deeper level. And they're really learning to um, have empathy and compassion for others. So that time of the day is going to be so important with helping our kiddos transition back. I am Christy Cage and I am the principal of Berkner High School STEM Academy. This is my 21st year um, in education and starting my fourth year as principal at Berkner High School. I am so excited to have all of our students back in the building as I'm sure all of our teachers will be as well. Um, one of the things like Helena said that we are planning to do um, actually in a few days we're having our RAM camp where we're inviting all of our students to come back into the building to reacclimate themselves to the building. Um, most most of our freshmen and sophomores were actually in junior high when COVID started. Um, and so we're giving them an opportunity to come up and meet teachers, meet um, fellow students, to do campus tours, um, and kind of just kind of learn the ins and outs of Berkner High School. Um, we are also, as Helena said, um, working with our teachers doing staff development week um, to focus on connections. Um, the first two weeks of school, you know, we know that there is a learning loss and we know that we need to, to focus on getting that taken care of, but in order to to do that we need to start with the connection piece um, and so the RIS division is connect learn grow and succeed in order to get to the learn grow and succeed you need to start with those connections so we're really focusing on that um, those first two weeks of school before the you know before we even really get going you know we're hearing we've, we've heard from a lot of our parents and and um, I think some some of the worries that our parents have are related to whether or not they're going to have a choice whether or not to have their student wear a mask or not. And I think that some parents are concerned about whether or not you know they're going to be asked if they've been vaccinated. And so, um, at the campus level, um, how are how are y'all going to handle it, and how are we going to handle that as a district? I think you know it's. It's, it's bigger than just one incident of a mask or not a mask. It's about how we instill the values of respect and empathy in our students. That's something that we um, hold in high regard. And uh, so I think that there's uh, the maturation of that process and helping students learn empathy and respect is about uh, understanding differences and understanding um, um, how we treat each other is really, really important. And so being uh, explicit about the circumstances that we're in right now and teaching the behaviors that we want students to have. Um, and that's behaviors of respect of our classmates, of our teachers, um, and of our school community as a whole. Um, so I think that it's built on the foundation of empathy and respect and inclusiveness, right? So that's an important part of being a part of our ISD. And so um, being intentional about teaching those behaviors and our expectations in that is a great place to start. Guys, I want to be just a little bit more specific and real because some of the concerns and questions that we've had are this specific. Um, if my student doesn't wear a mask at school, is there any fear? Do I have to fear that they're going to receive any type of retaliation or specifically bullying? What would you say to that as a campus principal? I think the first thing is that we would, we were, we're going to be very proactive in helping train the staff to look out for those situations that may occur. Um, we're gonna help train the staff in developing a culture in the classroom where people are respected. Um, and, and also to be on the lookout for if there's situations where students are not showing respect, 
um, that we address those immediately and make sure that they have a guideline for exactly how to address them. Um, and the other thing is just, you know, we're, we're open and available to parents and to students that have a concern. Um, if, a, if the student comes home and says, hey, I, you know, I was uncomfortable today because I had a mask on and this is what happened, please let the school know immediately so that we can address that behavior um, because we don't want anyone to feel different or bullied or anything of that nature. We want uh, the school to be a safe place where all kids want to come and learn. And we would, we would follow that same consistency at the elementary level. I mean, we want to take the proactive approach first, so um, the proper training for teachers and conversations during that social-emotional learning time. Um, but on the other side of that, we would want to know right away if something like that was going on so that we could address it immediately. Bullying is not tolerated on any RISD campus. No student will be criticized or shunned if they wear a mask, and no student will be criticized or shunned if they choose not to wear a mask. Um, if so, if someone thinks that they are, please let us know immediately and we will address it immediately. Bullying of any kind is not tolerated on any RISD campus. So parents need not worry about that in, in, in any way. And, and you know, one of the things that we're going to be doing, you know this, we've been talking about this as, as in, our, in our leadership groups all, you know, over the last couple of weeks this summer, is consistency and the importance of consistency that uh, all of our campuses there are you know are being consistent with that so you know we don't have any concern about that well y'all share since i have you here uh principals just a little bit more about that that collaborative culture that we have as a district in terms of leaders working together and, su and supporting all students any ideas or anything you'd want to share about that I think we're, we're a very collaborative district and we've already been, I think especially with the last year and a half, we've had to become even more collaborative and creative with how we approach different situations and how we're planning for the year. And so we've already begun doing that, um, you know, when we're getting ready to plan for our back to school nights um, or our assemblies and how we're conducting those things. And so principals and leaders, we have groups where we are just sharing ideas about how we're going to do things because we do realize that we, we do have to do things differently and, um, and, and just talk to each other and share ideas about how we can continue to do that, to do that and keep our students safe at the same time. I know um, recently, last week, um, my campus had our ILT meetings, and I'm sure um, the others have had their ILT meetings. Now, as what does well. ILT stand for? Instructional We're Leadership Team. We're trying not to team. use acronyms. Okay, there you go. Find that. Um, instructional Leadership Team meetings where um, all of our campus leaders come together and basically plan out the year and what we're going to do and how we're going to go about doing it. Um, and so, you know, I always believe that, um, you know, more heads are better than one. You know, you have a lot of different ideas and you can get pushback, not necessarily for or the fact of arguing, but to kind of work through all the different scenarios. Um, and so I know that we've all, all of us have been working with our instructional leadership teams for that purpose because collaboration is key. Dr. Stone, we have a question for you. Sure. As we're starting to plan for back to school, if an administrator is asked from a parent uh, for their child to be placed in the classroom of a teacher that has been vaccinated, what would your response be to that? Yeah, and I know that that question is already surfaced by a number of our parents. And really, um, and we've given this a lot of thought, but it really comes down to that we cannot make a classroom placement based on whether or not someone's going to wear a mask or whether or not they've been vaccinated. And um, we, we need people to understand that because in doing so, um, you are really... Um, disclosing health information that we cannot legally disclose um, and so therefore we won't do that. So we're, we, we cannot, we won't ask our teachers who has or hasn't been vaccinated um, and so therefore we won't make any type of classroom placement based on that information. And um, I know that, that that is one thing that parents are, are, are concerned and some of them are, are are, are wanting to have conversations about that. We just, we want them to know that we've thought that through really, really uh, long and hard, but basically what it comes down to is a legal requirement that we can't request that information from our employees. Let me just ask you, is there anything else that you would want to share? Is there anything else, you, like Josh, you're representing all junior high principals, all elementary principals, all of our high school principals. Is there anything that you would want to share out that you think that our parents and community need to hear from the campus leaders? I mean, first and foremost, 
how exciting this is to be able to connect with our students again, um, all of them. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, that's really where we're at is just over, we're just kind of overjoyed to be able to connect with students um, to help them continue to grow and succeed. Uh, we, that's why we come to work every day. We value that at the highest level. Um, and so teachers are ready to get back to the work and they're ready to support kids and they, to love on kids. And, and um, so those are the things that I think that we're most excited about. And that's what I want parents to know is, um, you know, we're ready. We're ready to connect with your students. We're ready to help them grow. Um, we know that not every day is going to be easy, um, but because of the community that we're in, we're going to be successful in that. And, um, and so it's an exciting part of the year. I would just echo what Josh just said. I think Josh said that perfectly. <laughs> but just we are so excited to have kids back. Um, you know, and we, we know that there's a lot of anxiety with sending our kiddos back to school in the start of the school year, but there's also a lot of excitement. And that's what we're feeling. And we know that our parents are sending their, their most prized possession back in our care, in our hands, and um, we can do it. We are, you know, after last year and seeing what all we were able to do, um, we feel fully confident that um, our kids are going to learn and grow and have fun and, and be safe at the same time. Our students are the most important individuals in our buildings, and we will do everything in our power to make sure that they are safe and supported. And we welcome any questions, concerns, any feedback that parents or students have at any time. Feel free to let us know. Ms. Clardy, Ms. Hal. Do you want to go ahead first? No, go ahead. Okay. You know, on behalf of the board, I just want to thank our teachers, you all, our teachers that are listening out there in our community for um, supporting us these past two years. This has not been easy, and but our staff and our teachers have been absolutely um, gone above and beyond. So I'm so thrilled with that. And I, I think the most used word I've heard in the past few months is I just want to be back to normal. And I think that that is, um, that is foremost in everybody's mind. And with that being said, I would like to ask about athletics. Are the football games on this year? Absolutely. <laughs> football on. games will be played, and we are excited. I'm going to look directly at the camera because the Rams are going to win. <laughs> and, and, we're full, and we're full stadium, correct? Is to that my correct? knowledge, yes, we are full stadium. Okay, okay, great. Thank you. So again, I want to echo what Ms. Cardi said. Uh, we are extremely grateful. Uh, we are humbled by the amount of respect towards the trust that we parents um, give you and you give in return to us. All the 18 months that we had gone together to this, we got this and now with the power of love, I want to express that to you, that PTA is here and ready and as much room as you give us and if you need a crush, we're dead and if we, you need a cheerleader, we will be the first ones there for you. So thank you for allowing us, Dr. Stone, for opening your doors to us and I truly appreciate all you know, of you. You know, around this table are represented, uh, representatives of the most important groups. Parents, uh, our board members, which represent the broad community, and then those who serve at the campus. And I think that that, that, that unity and, and sense of community that we have uh, going into the school year is what is going to truly power us. And as you mentioned, our theme is the power of love. And that's centered around everyone loving being back at school. Uh, but it's, it's more than anything. It's everything about the love that we have for each and every one of our students. And we all join together with that. And um, as our parents are reading the blueprint and, and having questions, you know, uh, we will have the Let's Talk feature that will be open. Uh, our campus principals have been apprised of the information as well. Um, and we want to we want to be accessible and open, um, as as Christy said, to anyone and everyone that has a question of us. And so we're looking forward to just a great school year. And uh, thank you all for joining us today, so that we can be open and transparent about what what's going to happen in 21, 22, which is going to be the best year in Richardson ISD's history. For I, sure, for sure, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah.